and risk deploying advanced quantitative methods to understanding, measure, and manage complex risk. In his previous position at Resource Pro, David established a global security program across US, India, China, and worked with insurance industry clients. He ensured secure delivery of services for over 6,000 offshore employees via ISO 2701 and SSAE-18 certified security program. Key initiatives include establishing global security culture, expanded international SOC services, and rapid increasing increases in program maturity by Fortune 500 clients. I could probably read on and on for another half hour about all of his accomplishments, but prior to his IT and security career, he served as an operational team member and flight operations director at Goddard Space Flight Center. David also served in the U.S. Air Force as part of the Defense Metrological Satellite Program. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Maryland and is a certified risk information systems control um, and open fair. So t today, David Alfering is um, our keynote speaker, and today he is speaking about it's time to ask why. So let's welcome David. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm appreciative of being here. Um, with all that, I think we're done. We can just we can just all go home. That was that was. I didn't realize my intro was so long-winded. Um, so not by intent. That's an internal product for for Marsh. And so when when I when I took this talk on, you know, I was expecting somebody to go. Well, here's three major points we want you to cover. And instead, I said, "What do you want to hear? What what can I talk to people about?" And they're like, "What do you want to talk about?" I'm like. You know, that's a good question. That's a really good question. So I started writing down a lot of ideas. I'm like, what, what would I talk to people about? And, I, and if some of you know me, you know, when I start talking, it usually goes on and on and on. Um, and I have a central set of core things that I've developed as a CISO. And this some, in some ways goes back to my time at Motorola. All right, let's, let's, let's unearth, let's, let's, be, let's get out the anthropologist, the paleoanthropologist, and go back to corporate names nobody knows anymore. But I started out, you know, when I, one of the corners I turned was Six Sigma. I'm like, why does a system work? That was, you know, so when I come to why, this was the core element as a security leader that I began to learn I had to answer. Why do we do this? Why do we do it in proportion to the ways that we do it? And... In your roles, people ask you why. As a parent, do kids ever ask you why? Yeah, they, they're really good at it, sometimes excruciatingly. I think they know acupuncture, emotional acupuncturists. That's children, right? They can instantly drill in on something painful to the point you go, ask your mother, ask your, you know, go ask, go ask your significant other. And, but they're, they're genuinely motivated by the question why. And I think the stakeholders that we engage are genuinely motivated by the why. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Let's talk about some of the other contexts in which people ask you why. If you go to a board meeting, hopefully somebody asks you why. If they don't ask you why, you've got to worry a little bit about your engagement with the board. If it's just a series of slides in which you're dropping some, some dry content and people go, oh, thank God, we're done. You know, but why comes in there? Why do we do this? Why is this relevant? You know, I, I had a... I had a a coach uh, last year, and I ran a deck, and at the end of the deck, she went, why do I care about anything you just said? So why? So I came back to why. I, why I'm going to talk about why today. Um, go out to Google, search breaches, search why, and bottom line is you're going to find out that our budgets are going up, and people are expecting more, and this is going to come back to why we do it rather than the what we do. There's a whole lot of what in the next room, and that's awesome. Technology is, I'm still addicted to technology. I confess. I'm Dave Elfring. I'm addicted to technology. Hi, Dave. My journey to why began years ago. I had a great CEO. I really loved working with 
If you work with the CEO at a trucking company, most of them, there's a whole lot of color there I can't talk to you about. Uh, so I'm paraphrasing the discussion here. Uh, but I went in, you know, it was early in my career, and I'm like, vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities, I'm very concerned about vulnerabilities. So I got a system, got a, you know, a test license, scanned thousands of hosts. And as you can imagine, the first time you run a vulnerability scan, there's a whole lot of red in there. It looks like a bad audit report, right? Um, and so I'm like, I need to go talk to the CEO. I need the right, I need the permission to purchase this. So in short, I went in and said, hey, I'd like to get a vulnerability management system, testing and management system. And he literally did say, okay, what's, what, what is that and what does it do? So I explained, we're going to run security tests across all these thousands of systems and I'm going to find some problems. And I ran it and I found thousands of things that we need to fix. He was like, are you sure? I mean, so I showed him a chart. I had thousands of things. I'm like, well, this is a CVSS score between 9 and 10 on 1,278 hosts. And you can see the alignment with this column and this column and this column. And we have this is bad. This over here is bad. And he's like, well, tell me about bad. What would happen? What bad things could happen? I said, well, if somebody exploits it, it could be used against our systems, right? They could exploit the systems and attack us. So I, yeah, yeah, it was FUD. I was, I was using FUD. And he said, okay, how often has that happened in the past? I'm like, well, aside from the times I do it, I don't know. Um, he's like, okay, well, then what's going to happen in the future? How many times is this likely to happen? I'm like, well, I really can't tell you that either. I mean, it, it could happen at any time. And he said, I, tell me what could happen as a result. What could happen if we don't fix these things? And my answer was, well, again, you know, they're going to attack us. People are going to attack us. Who's going to attack us? I'm like, well, they, they are going to attack us. And at the end of the day, he said, research this. When you can tell me what could happen and how it could result in something bad for this company, and then come on back. He wasn't, he wasn't being mean. He just really wanted to know why this mattered to a trucking company. And so I called uh, a friend of mine at, at UNO, actually, Dr. Blaine Burnham, and I was complaining. I said, geez, Blaine, I went in with my best pitch. I had thousands of things in red, and the CEO didn't care. He's like, well, wait a minute, back up. Tell me about this company. What do they do? I'm like, well, we have trucks. So he said, did you talk to him about trucks? Did you talk to him at all about his business? I'm like, well, no, this isn't about his business. This is about the vulnerabilities. I need to show him that there's all these bad things out here waiting to bite us in various places. Um, so, and he said, no, 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 you got to back up. You need, to, before, before you can talk to him about vulnerabilities, you need to understand why this matters to that business, and you need to understand why this is going to matter to that CEO. So that was the beginning. So at the end, you know, the CEO did have an eject button. It was a good conversation. Um, he was more careful about booking meetings with me. He's like, can we do this in 15 minutes? Last time we scheduled an hour, and I think he was, he was, it was basically an ambient for him. Um, so I started researching. I'm like, okay, there's some things I don't know, and I want to know. And so I'm a researcher. I, I'm a data. In, in addition to technology, I'm a data addict. More data. More data is better. That's, that's our mantra sometimes from an IT perspective. And, but I also read books. And um, this one pulled me right out, of my, right out of my shell. You know, Ron Hubbard, very well known, how to measure anything. And he literally, this is an extract Solutions for managing risks that are no better than astrology. And I thought about what I went to the CEO with. He could have looked at it like astrology. I was giving very general good advice. And what is astrology but general good advice? It could apply to anybody. Um, and yet, let's take a look at some of the results. Now, we're facing, a, call it a crisis, right? If you go back to from 2018 to 2019, this data... Uh, shows the claims rates. What's happening from a cyber liability standpoint? Well, we know claims are up. Uh, how many of you have thoroughly enjoyed your last cyber liability renewal process? There ain't any hands up. Um, and I, I take part in, in the renewals of, of cyber liability policies. I, I have a front row seat, and I understand the difficulties. 
and it's because of these numbers in part. Um, I just realized I didn't reference where they came from. I'll add that back up a little bit later. But this is publicly available data. This is not internal data. Anybody from Marsh know this isn't our data. Uh, so this made me so angry. I'm like, no, I, I, I know I know better than that. I am not an astrologist, and yet I had to admit there's some things that I didn't know. There's some things that I couldn't relate back to people. And it brought me to this, I called it a game show, but would you rather? You know, years ago, I was at a talk by Gene Kim, and he played a would you rather. He goes, I won't go into the scenario, but it's, it's obviously a rhetorical scenario, you know, would you rather have a blank check budget for technical controls for one year or budget for an accurate risk assessment and three technical controls? And it's, it is, it's not a trick question, obviously it's not even a realistic question, but we've typically chosen and some of, sometimes we have had blank checks. People have said, all right, this cyber thing's serious, tell me what you need to go fix it. And in part, that's a bit of a dysfunctional relationship of people say, I'm going to give you money and you go fix it because guess who's accountable for the fix? It's not a partnership. You're now accountable as, uh, you know, some people say the, the, the bear is on your back and you still haven't gotten to the why it's important. I did want to make sure I marked game show host because I, I ran this slide by my kids and they were like, who's the old man in the bad suit? I'm like, game show host, let's label things. All right, before we begin, um, I probably could use this picture, but I really like blurring out pictures and say due to copyright, I can't show you this picture. It's just, it's my dad joke in the slide. So before we begin, uh, just a couple of fundamental things. For profit, for profit companies make money or they die, right? They have to make money. It's the pulmonary system of business. Therefore, as a CISO, security leader, as anybody in the company, I need to care about the company making money. Risk is uncertainty about loss. And this was an interesting discussion when I, when I was joining Marsh. They're like, tell me about risk and how you consider risk and risk management. Like, well, risk is about the, you know, the potential for loss, losing money. Risk management is the art of pulling back the cover and saying, what is it we have? Are there scary monsters under the bed or are there not? Let's look under the bed. So that's part of you know, risk management. And, and then the obvious question is, and you can see I'm angling, I've got that background in quant starts to shine through a little bit. How soon, how often, and how much is it going to cost? These are some things that we need to bear in context for what we do. Risk management is protection. Now you can certainly, there's a couple choices I'm gonna talk about here in just a moment, but risk management is how we protect ourselves. You know, there's a, there's a joke that I, I like to tell, my kids will cringe, but it's like even people who believe in predestination look both ways before they cross the road, am I right? They do. So risk management is in every facet of our lives. You probably thought about where you parked your car today. It's like, well, is this a place where somebody's gonna break a window um, as you're walking across the street? Risk management is part of that, and it's about how we protect ourselves. Every company has a maximum amount of risk they can sustain. And I'm, I'm thinking you know, about for some recent banking stories where you know, due to poor risk management, and we'll talk a little bit about you know, those use cases, those cases. Um, and that is a term I hadn't seen before. Now, if you're, if you're fair, if you're into fair, we just call it capacity. But risk-bearing capacity is a term uh, in, from the insurance perspective about describes that. What happens, not before you go out of business, but before there's a major impact that is, has material impact on your organization. Material meaning it's, you know, could be your, you know, audit, regulators, your clients, your stakeholders, your board, you know, boards start to change over, CEOs are leaving and those kinds of things. So risk bearing capacity has a lot of ramifications for us. Sorry, keep an eye on the time, not checking my, my uh, Facebook status. Risk bearing capacity, what is it? What is it? Why is it important? We need to know, and this is something, you know, working with clients, we start to talk to them about, and this isn't a pitch for what I do, but we help them look at what their risk bearing capacity is. Where is the point at which from a materiality standpoint, heads start rolling, stocks start getting shorted, uh, those kinds of things that can have a major impact that complicates the life of 
your CFO, your board, you and everybody at the company potentially. It's not just about breaches. Breaches are one method that you can reach that. Ransomware, those things, they can impact us to that extent. I want to talk about two more things from insurance. Uh, you had no idea you were going to get an insurance sales seminar today, did you? The most important thing is survival, right? Can the firm survive this? Where, at what point do we lose consciousness and the plane just kind of descends into the canyon and there's flames, right? The second is continuing operation. All right, we're not going to die, but how do we continue? It's starting to sound like now I'm merging into business continuity talk. What I found funny was, you know, when I looked into, as I was researching risk-bearing capacity, because it was a fairly new concept to me, uh, I'm like, it's used more commonly in agriculture and investment banking. And I thought, hmm, risk management in, in agriculture. I had no idea that my father, the Dutch farmer, was such a good risk manager. And then I thought about what he did. He understood the materials he was working with. He understood his land. He understood the impact of the environment, you know, the chemicals that he needed to work, use. He understood things that could impact his ability to render the product that he needed to. He was an awesome risk manager. He knew the risk to his business. He knew the risk to his family. He understood his risk-bearing capacity. This is actually probably my primary slide. You know, I had a, I had a, I had a boss one time, I, I drew this up, and he was like, well, this looks kind of remotely sales-oriented, but I'm not sure what you're telling me. This is, in, in a nutshell, kind of a, call it a business continuity plan. It's a merger of a couple things. Number one, it, it does come back to um, lean thinking. Um, but there's also a book, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it's Business Canvas, right? I started thinking about how does security integrate with all the layers of the business? How do we, how do we, how do we in a nutshell, show our strategy? And every business has key resources that it needs. Could be internet, power, could be the building, it could be all kinds of things. It could be your Salesforce systems, it can be your HRM, human resource management systems, your financial systems, your production systems. If you think about like going back to my trucking days, how do you schedule trucks? How do you track trucks? What are those core things that are needed in order for people to do their work? And then people themselves have groups of activities that they do. They have things that they do every single day. Some of these turn into processes. Some of these turn into redundant things that they do over and over and over again, and those form value propositions, and the value propositions are delivered to all of us, to the clients, through uh, channels, right? There are channels, so if you, if you talk about software, for example, they have channels on how they get things, how they define their values, and those are consumed by the people who find value in what we do, and so we have to have activities to do things, turn them into processes, key deliverables, value offerings, and we, we get paid to do that. So this is money. The, the left side is the money side. And then there's, you know, take these as generic examples. It's not an exhaustive list of things that security does, and some of your security teams do more of them than others. There's no magic equation for how security teams organize. I think this list might have originally come from Gartner. What are the 10 things you must get right um, if you're looking for the research note? And so one of the things that we didn't do well, I didn't do well, self-confession, was I didn't align what I did with what the company needed and how it needed it. It has to be a proportionality. We protect things in proportion. And, and I know we have these discussions and we tell people, it's like, well, it would cost us... Uh, let's say privileged access management. PAM has a reputation deserved for being extremely expensive, and yet we can break down the business case for it. I'm not talking about ROI. ROI, is, ROI isn't always clear. But the proportionality is the critical thing. We protect in proportion. Now, the risk isn't always money, right? You can have regulatory risk. That's a real risk. You might have fines and things that could apply to you depending on your business and how tightly regulated that you are. Um, but I, I love this quote from Lean Thinking that from a security standpoint, and here's maybe what, what I figured out from that conversation with the CEO was, I needed to know how the company made money. 
And that pulled me into business continuity. Um, years ago, one of my CISO friends said, don't ever take business continuity, it's where CISOs go to die. Well, I took it anyway. And the next talk that I had was somebody telling me, don't take identity and access management. That's where CISOs go to die. Well, I lived through it. Um, I've, got, I've got some awful scars, but uh, it, it all worked out in the end. So you see that thing looks like a tripod in the, in the red square. It looks like War of the Worlds. You're like, oh, look, it's a War of the Worlds memento. Um, no, that is a top-down look at how does the business structure, and of course, not all processes can be encapsulated in this way. The, Companies have thousands of things that they may do. Typically, there are those high-level things, and I'm going to walk through that. First, I'm going to talk about the non-BIA, BIA. Um, anybody here ever do a business impact assessment, business impact analysis? Anybody? All right. Um, typically, these are bottom-up. Right? It's almost, it almost starts sometimes with a, with a CMDB, because I, I know when I was in the IT department, and I said, hey, business impact, and they're like, oh yes, we got a whole, we can, we can provide you the full inventory of everything we have, and all you have to do is take that thousand piece jigsaw puzzle and turn it into a picture for the company. That's difficult, and sometimes it takes years. And having all those components, it's absolutely necessary. It is necessary. The recipe that was more meaningful for me was that top-down map. I started out at the top of the company, you know, and said, tell me about the things that we do. You know, it, I made the, fir the first mistake I made was I said, hey, tell me about your core business processes. And they were like, what? <laughs> what, are you, what? What's this guy talking about? Get him out of my office. Um, and I said, okay, tell me about the things that your people do every day. What are the things that they do every day? And so we started actually defining the daily tasks that people do. What does this department produce? So I started defining those value offerings, those value streams, and now I could start to associate it with revenue. How much money do those things make? Because if you're talking to the board, the board's like regulatory, regulatory, okay, blah, blah, blah. Money, cha-ching, we're in. You know, you, you lit us up. We, you had me at money. And so I started tracking all of those things down, and I came up with a really kind of an ugly way to do it. Um, the, the important thing that I learned here was to be quick. You know, I would get into somebody's office, 15 minutes, tell me about these core things, 20 minutes, 30 minutes at the max. Then I would use a mind map, and I will show you a, you know, it's going to be an ugly diagram, I promise you. So if you're expecting ugly, I'm going to fulfill that, absolutely. So I started drawing these things and said, does this look like what you do? And they were like, yeah. Or they're like, no, that actually goes over here. So I started iterating on that. And I am going to talk about loss tables because the other thing I found out was in, in an executive stakeholder meeting, and I said, hey, you know, CFO, tell me about the loss tables, you know, the revenue schedule for the company. He was like, I'm the, I, I don't have that. Um, which was, I was like, wait a minute, if you don't know how we're making money and where, who does? And the answer was, well, I guess you're going to find out. That's one way to get assigned uh, the part of your job description that says other things as assigned. So financial analysis is understanding what's important and why. A top-down BIA. So I didn't necessarily directly associate these two things, but one led me to the other. As, as I built the top-down revenue model and confirmed it with the stakeholders, it became something really meaningful. Suddenly people in IT went, wait a minute, that's how that works? That's what they do? I'm like, yeah, that's what they do and that's how they do it. Sometimes I found undocumented things, but it came up, it was a more finite list than starting with, we have 12,158 assets on the network that have IP addresses and now we're going to group them into things. I'm like, no, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw away a majority of that if I need to. I'm just going to hone in from the top to the bottom. I'm going to draw this from the top and then get to what does that process make in terms of money? How often does it work? How does it work? What's the schedule? It's almost like a schedule of things, right? And this, again, comes back to business continuity. I absolutely love being part of business continuity. Why? Because it is about the value that the company makes. It's about restoring the value, preserving the value. So, from a loss table standpoint, you may find other ways to do it. Uh, this is actually just a canned example from 
a fair example, Jones Fair. Um, so it is canned, but it just to illustrate the point of how you can draw this back, and you can even confirm this or like he, you know, if you've ever done business continuity plan, uh, and it doesn't isn't associated with the priorities based on money. Business priorities are determined by how loud people shout, how many tickets they can open. And if you make the ticket red, therefore it's worse and more priority and people triage based on that. They're like, nope, we're gonna, we're gonna triage based on the value of what's going on here. And I'm going to communicate that to people very openly. I'll, I'll, ha I'll hammer on communications a little bit more. <sighs> this brings me to another thing that um, years ago, I heard the term risk retention for the first time. Uh, I was getting a cyber liability policy and they said, hey, your retention is 250K. I'm like, is that my deductible? They're like, no, it's retention. It's the risk you keep. I'm like, okay, whatever. Here's your 85 grand. Give me the $10 million policy and let's just move on. I didn't really, you know, I'm like, okay, that's fine. You know, but risk retention, how much risk you keep and whether you're doing it from a conscious standpoint, a, a, at least somewhat organized standpoint, when you when people say organized processes and you talk about companies, they go, have you ever been inside of a company? It looks like, it looks like a, you know, a, a thunderstorm at midnight that blows in and it just, it, I, we're not sure exactly what the structure is, but it's, it's, it's often interesting to watch. So active risk retention, you're aware of the risk. This is back to the risk management. We're part of risk management, right? Whether, you know, I remember having a discussion with one of my, one of my frontline security personnel because I was pulling them into training about some of this related to this. It was actually quantitative training. So we had a similar or common vocabulary. And his response was, well, you're kind of the numbers guy. This probably makes sense to you. What does it matter to me? That is, that I just, my, my head exploded. I'm like, whoa, there's a disconnect here. What we do matters to the way this company makes money. We are here to protect and preserve the value creation and building of money, right? And not that this is a money seminar, um, but that's our relevant role. It absolutely matters to you as a security professional what this represents to the company. So anyway, I'll save you the whole speech. Active risk retention. Hey, we're, we're making a decision about it. Passive risk retention. Failure to identify. Now this pulls me back to the Ron Hubbard slide about, hey, how are we managing risk? And are we really managing risk? When I showed the CEO uh, a, a spreadsheet with all those thousands of red things, was I managing risk? It was in there somewhere, but it, the context wasn't in, in business. And so you could actually say that that was possibly passive retention. So you fail, your, you fail to identify, you fail to act, which is... You know, that, you know, talking about errors and omissions, directors and officer type relationships to insurance, that suddenly matters a whole lot in that failure to act. Or you forget to act, you know. Um, yeah, the light's been on my dashboard telling me that I'm low on oil for three weeks, but I'll get to it. I'll get to it. That is passive risk retention. You are retaining the risk that you're going to have to rebuild that engine. Um, okay, so, the, so the, 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 the risk retention quote, I just, I wanted to work something Something old, something blue, and I know it's not a wedding. So that's a quote from the song Tom Sawyer by Rush, in case you're wondering. And of course, the two paths, that's Robert Frost. Um, and so there's the two paths, and take the pass, path less traveled, which was kind of what led me to the quantitative um, nature of my history. So passive risk retention, how might that look? So I thought about this. So, you know, the, the spectrum of risk, I'm borrowing this from Paul Proctor. It's one of his old famous slides about risk can be anywhere on the spectrum from highly risk but in, highly but informed risk where you spend very little money and you have high amounts of risk so we're on the risk spectrum just take it as you know red to green just because i love stoplights red yellow and green is the center of my universe and so what if we tell people we're over here but we're really all the way over here and there's a gap in between now i'm not here to defend cyber liability carriers, but from 2015 through 2018, we were transferring a lot of passive risk to them because we were in essence going, I don't really know, but I'm going to get this insurance policy so that I know the company's going to get paid if something bad happens. But we didn't really necessarily 
always know how much risk we were transferring. And if you go to those numbers, suddenly 2019, 2020, there's this huge crest in claims. And that is money out of the insurance company's pockets. Guess what they don't like? Money going out of their pockets. Because uh, they got a business model too. Um, I, I, I promised I would relate back to Silicon Valley Bank. And so here we go. You know, Silicon Valley Bank, prior to all of the unfortunate recent events, didn't have a risk officer. There was nobody there to have the voice for risk or throw up the alarms. Now, there's a whole lot of reasons why they might not have been there any longer. I, have no, I don't know how good they were at their job, and maybe they, maybe they were out of there for a reason, or they hit their own eject button. They're like, yeah, this ain't going anywhere good. I am out. But they didn't have it. And I love this quote that they were not aligned, their risk was not aligned with reality. This is an illustration of how risk is not aligned with reality. The reality is over here. Risk is over here. You're in the red, and you just aren't acknowledging it. You're not even necessarily aware of it. Um, you know, it's that time when, you know, the, you know, what happened before the engine blew up? It's like, well, I don't know. The light had been on for a long time, and you know, like, well, now the engine's blown up, and we have a different discussion. So active risk retention. I love this quote. Um, <laughs> are we going to make decisions here? Are we just going to look at pictures? So if you think about, you know, meetings you go to where everybody has, you know, uh, analytics and analytics, uh, you never, never bring analytics to a gunfight. A um, little, board, little board humor. How do we make decisions based on active retention? And how do we decide to transfer risk? And this is a term, again, through insurance. It's risk transference. I'm like, no, 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 I'm just going to sign up to get money if something bad happens. Well, that's transfer. So what if we measure it and we say, never mind how you got there. could be fair. Maybe you're using the ALE equation out of the CISSP book. God help us. Um, but you've got a number. Hopefully it's realistic. It's not, it's not an example of passive risk, but it's realistic. And now we can draw up scenarios and say, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this risk? So yeah, we're going to make some decisions. We're not just going to look at pictures. You can accept the risk as it is. That's a valid decision as long as it's an informed decision. You know, I, I had a discussion with the CIO one time, and he's like, well, what do you think about you know, representing risk? And he's like, and don't tell me that it's a business decision and the business can do what it wants. I'm like, uh, OK, let me go to plan B, because <laughs> that was my answer. Um, Example one of how to fail an interview. But accept risks it is. Long, you know, I tell people, I will do business, what you want, and what is relevant to the business, as long as I don't break the law. Won't break the law. This is like the caveats from the genie you know, in the Disney movie. It's like, you, know, you can't raise the dead. You know, I can't make people love you, that kind of thing. Well, same thing. I'm not going to break the law for you. Um, so I won't do that. But other than that, we can exist on that risk spectrum anywhere you want to be. But by the way, it's going to be in the meeting minutes. We do need meeting minutes. <laughs> so we can accept it. We can do some things with it. We can spend money. We can transfer it. Perfectly valid. Let's talk a little bit about liability for passive risk. Are we liable for passive risk? Uh, anybody seen the, the and it probably, this, I think this is a casebook study, T.J. Hooper. Anybody familiar with T.J. Hooper? All right, a couple people are, so I can still make up some things to make up for the gaps that I have. But in essence, T.J. Hooper, tugboats, you know, they're, they're pulling cargo. They didn't have radios at the time, or the radios were out, but they didn't have them on the boats. And so bottom line is the cargo was lost due to a storm, and their defense was there's nothing that says I have to have radios in the boats to warn me of anything. This might start to sound like an allegory that points to other things from an IT perspective, right? Well, there's nothing that's in the law that says I have to have multi-factor authentication on access to Office 365 email. There's no law that says that. No, you're right, there isn't. And yet there is due diligence. Did you do the things that were available to you to remedy the risk and not just passively pass that risk on to the people that need your services? So the other reason I, I, I use this, this uh, case was I just love the name, Judge Learned Hand. You can't make this stuff up. Real name. Awesome. 
And what he said was, there are things you need to do, and no matter your excuses, you can't excuse them. There is no excuse. When you have a ready remedy for doing something, you don't do it, you're liable. Now, that's a very old case, and there's been a whole lot of cases since, but I like that one. So now I want to go to something a bit more abstract, because this is somewhat the direction of industry. All right, sometimes when I talk to people, they're like, well, California passed this law, and uh, California. Or they go, oh, the EU, GDPR, right? We spent years thinking about GDPR and going, really? It's going to be expensive, you know, well, that's what we said in the 70s about car exhaust. Catalytic converters, they're expensive. So we whine about these things. And yet it becomes a reality because that's the direction things are going. I don't know that German IDW, you know, PS340 is going to become a global standard. But what's interesting about it is as a company, there, if you're in Germany, you have to have risk-bearing capacity awareness. Do you know? They're asking you, do you know? How do you know? You're liable for it. So your risk-bearing capacity must be measured. Now, the latter point here in terms of DORA, and I kind of wanted to use this because, of course, it rhymes with Explora, and I didn't go get that clip art, but the Digital Operations Resilience Act from the EU. You may have heard of this. You may not. I think that you will, especially of international operations. In a nutshell, this is, like it says, it's about resilience, right? The world is linked. And if you go read this legislation, and it's law, you've, you've got some time. Uh, so if you have EU operations, finding out the scope and the applicability, it might be difficult, but you can find it. So what's interesting, when, when I looked at DORA, at the official uh, version of it, is the word third party appears 351 times. It's not that long of a law. So I get an idea of some of the things that they're looking at. So third party and resilience, risk-bearing capacity. This isn't just, you know, Dave up there talking about stuff that he's read about. I think this is a, an indicator from a directionality standpoint of where things are going to go. And so since it's done in the EU, California, some other states probably likely move into this as well. And I promised I would talk a little bit about risk quantification um, bottom line is, you know, if we, if we go back to 2017, you know, Gartner, for example, was extremely excited about risk quantification. They're like, oh my God, this is like going to solve so many things. And then we got, you know, I started a quant practice internally based on it and found out it was kind of difficult. You know, it took me, it was, a, it was, there was a, a long lead time. I'll tell you the good things about FAIR. You know, I'm not up here, this isn't a FAIR talk. I'm not pushing you for quant. But it gave us a common language to talk about risk, to define what is a risk. Well, it's loss. Because if you go and talk to some IT people, uh, I was at a Gartner conference, and somebody said, well, risk, you know, the cloud is risk. I'm like, no, cloud's a thing. Cloud's not risk. If there's risks that are associated with those assets in cloud, but cloud is not a risk. Yes, it is. People are going to use it. Ah, now we started talking about some of the risk. What are they going to do with the cloud? Well, they're going to upload PII data. They're going to upload it from, anyway. So we get down that whole rabbit hole of, you know, we need to look at risk in terms of scenarios. And it, what I liked about this, and I found it also painful, was in terms of companies that perform quantitative risk or have quantitative risk practices, about two-thirds of them go, huh, that's interesting. It, it's kind of, you know, it, it's something to talk about. But only 32% are acting on those things. And so what impact is it really having? It's, to me, that sounds like we're, we're talking about empty calories, right? We're consuming, but what are we doing with it? Are we converting quant into the why and turning that into action? Have you ever gone to a meeting and somebody goes, well, here's the, the four things that are going to happen after this meeting. And my question is, great, who are, who's going to do them? Oh, well, we don't know. I'm like, well, then we have a wish list. We don't have a list of things we're going to do. We have a list of, you know, might as well be singing for somebody's a jolly good person, right? The outcome, right? We were not providing outcomes. And why was that? What did we run into? I Guilty again. You know, I, suddenly I'm like, whoa, I, can put, I got loss tables and I can go measure this, I can measure that, and I can create scenarios, I can do this and this and this. And we started to want to measure everything. Here's what you can't measure, which is, what is the bottom line things that we need to do just because, like T.J. Hooper, you know, they could have said, well, we're currently doing a quantitative analysis of 
why we need radios in the tugboats. It's like, no, you just need to have radios in the tugboats because it was a, a, it's a common element. It's bottom line, minimum accepted practices. And from a minimum accepted practices standpoint, uh, how many of you have filled out a, a, a cyber liability questionnaire? Uh, just say ever. I've, okay. Um, have, I, won't, I won't get the branding, but it's not fun. So, you know, if you go into renewal or you're getting a policy, you may have multiple questionnaires and their words, their PDF, web forms, they're all kinds of different things. But cyber liability insurance is beginning to do some things that I found interesting professionally, which was, you know, I went into it thinking, oh, whoa, Mar you know, I'll say, you know, go Google Marsh 12, um, not m March 12th, just Marsh 12, and I'm not pushing it, but it's a list of things, and it's things that insurance carriers are expecting us to do. They're not asking you to quantify it. They don't even care if you quantify it. They've quantified it plenty. They know they're losing money because of these practices. So it's not down to the why. There's the whole why and the alignment with business and the business BIA and if you're into BCP, you know, RTO and, R, you know, those kinds of things, re, you know, re, recovery time objectives, recovery point objectives. But what they want to know is, are you at least addressing the fundamental things that have caused this rise in claims? Um, so cyber liability, what isn't it? Cyber liability coverage is not a way to just go, I don't know, let the insurance company worry about it. That's passive retention and it's passing, literally passing th the buck to them. And they're like, nope, we're done with that. We're not going to do that any longer. And you could probably still slip through, but they've changed the game. And you're like, wait a minute. We, if we want to do quantitative things, the insurance companies have data. Yep. I can tell you, that, you know, as somebody that works at Marsh, we absolutely have data, a lot of data. We're not necessarily going to give it to you for free, though, so just spoiler alert. Um, I'll tell you something about cyber liability insurance maybe you have or haven't thought about. Using cyber liability insurance as a way of, as part of your due diligence, the people you're doing business with um, that you depend on, if you come down to the why, why is this company important to us? Well, they process our payroll. It's like, okay, that could be kind of important. Or their it's accounts receivable. You can ask them, and people, you know, it, when I worked at a, at a third-party administration firm, we absolutely were asked multiple times a day, usually, hey, tell us about your cyber liability coverage, your liability coverage, your liability coverage. Um, low coverage, you know, somebody, if you see a policy and it's like, wait, this is a $2 million policy for business interruption, and there's a $1 million retention, I'm like, there's something funny going on there, and I made those numbers up, but it's a real case. Or if they come back and say, well, we had insurance, and it lapsed, was it, did, was it a conscious choice, or were you let go by your carrier? Um, good discussions to have. So I, I, I said I was going to talk about, you know, I call this, you must be this tall to ride. So minimum practices, minimum standard practices. I think this is a perfectly acceptable way to talk about the things that we have to do. You can download this. A broker might call you, so I'm not trying to push you to engage with Marsh, but I think we've got a list that's worth talking about. You know, the, the Marsh 12 key controls. Trust me, it's not just 12 things, you know, and there are probably about 200 things that Marsh assesses, and I find it interesting. In fact, I find it fascinating as somebody who spent 25 years, you know, in security programs and inside of companies and talking to CISOs about what it is we do. Now, this, again, doesn't necessarily go back to the why. This is kind of a what, but it's, it's sort of fun. And so within that, there's a whole lot of things. Um, it's not a PCI council type scenario yet. The, the carriers are, are not coalescing yet, yet. Is it possible? Maybe. And so these March 12 might be as close as we get to that for the moment uh, to getting to that PCI type scenario. What have we talked about? Um, we've talked about more controls don't necessarily equal more security. You know, I found that out. You know, to some degree, you know, as I've talked, when I was working with insurance companies in, in my previous role, sometimes I was surprised at how many controls people got by without. 
And I'm like, really, nothing bad has happened? Um, and so you start to question. Think, let's think about this for a moment. What, you know, go back, rewind the clock five years, and if you said, we're going to send everybody home, and they're going to work from home, and they're going to use their broadband as a security person, I went, whoa, that, uh-uh, no way. That, you know how much risk that would give us? Well, we lived through it. I'm not saying some bad things didn't happen, but the world didn't end. So sometimes more controls doesn't equal business outcomes. Cyber liability carriers are pushing back on all of us. You know, when I got my first policy back in, I don't know, 2015, 2016, I was like, all right, cool. Mainly because um, I really loved the coverage that I had from Beasley because it included something called Beasley Breach Response, that little cool PDF BBR book, and it had all these vendors, people I could contact. I'm like, this is a great list. So I really liked getting that, and it gave me some assurance for the things that I knew because I, I knew something about how much PII we accumulated and what the breaches would cost. Carriers are setting standards, passive rinse, risk retention. I wanted to work this in. Uh, lipoprotein cholesterol, bad cholesterol. The EU is coming, maybe. But there's a good harbinger of things that might yet happen. Risk bearing capacity, risk management, risk management without relevance to the why, to the core processes of the business, you can get by, right? And, and to be honest, transparent, I see a lot of security teams that are buried in places where they're not effectively able to serve their enterprise role. And there's some passive risk retention there for sure. Security risk management without relevance is only going to get you so far. So parting thoughts. I like the question why. When I first started working with auditors years ago, I'm like, oh, for God's sake, they're always asking me why. And it's painful. They, they again back to acupressure. They find that painful spot, and they I'm like it just makes electricity jolts run up my spine and into my head. And then I realized, like, well, actually, what they're asking is a legit question. Sometimes, I mean, quite sometimes it were you know external auditors. I think sometimes we're just getting paid by the pound, but that's a whole other story. Um, so I learned to ask. I, I want people to ask why. When I was rolling out. In tune, and people said, well, wait, you're going to implant this on my phone? You're going to monitor everything I do? I'm like, number one, you're not that interesting. Number two, I don't have that much time on my hands. So no, I'm not. But I appreciate it. People asking me why, because now we can have a conversation. So I encourage people to ask why. You know, I want to go meet with the mailroom. I want to meet with everybody in the organization that I can to get an understanding of the challenges that they have. This goes back to my IAM discussion, identity and access management. And by engaging with people, they start to learn that we care why. And the, the conclusion here is we can change it from why with a question mark to an exclamation point. Yeah, it's a little theatric, but uh, I was like, how would I, how, would I, how would I end this? And the answer is I'm going to end it here. These, a group of CISOs you know, wrote a book because... Uh, they need 58 people to buy a book um, because when you write things about security, 58 people tend to, will probably buy it. Hopefully hundreds or thousands will buy it. But I love this reference. The CISOs, it's about, our, it's about our areas of influence and persuasion. And I'm not talking about evil powers of persuasion. I'm talking about that engagement and letting people ask why and talking to people and finding out their why and applying security in our craft in a way that matters to them and that they understand why it matters to them. And for something really abstract, if you go back 2,500 years, the education of Cyrus, I think, all right, so I've talked about money, and I've talked about financial management, and I've talked about lost tables and all of these things. But in the end, you know, helping our businesses thrive, now it maybe it depends on your business. Maybe you look at it and go, oh, really? Should they thrive? I'm not sure. Whole nother, whole nother existential question. Go read some Tolstoy for crying out loud. But it is a noble end, right? We have a noble mission to fulfill, which is the making sure the business is going to survive, making sure that it can continue operation. And to me, that is a noble end. And on that note, we are at the appendix just because you know what you do when you're like, I got three extra slides that I don't know what to do with. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to include them. I'm going to throw them in the appendix. So that's it. I'm going to, st I'll stop to see if there's any, any questions. 
hey, I've got a question here. And, and they're going to run a microphone over to you. Just, I'm not, I'm not delaying. I love the talk about the BIA, and I think it's extremely valuable. But my question becomes, are CIOs and CISOs the consumer, or are they the driver? Who should own it within an organization? I think to some degree this depends on the complexity of the organization. So as, as a CISO, I owned the BIA simply because it's where, you know, I'm, I was the one who went, hey, we don't have this. Um, and, and actually the first one I ever created was on a whiteboard in the middle of an outage at 3 a.m. in the morning, sitting there going, oh, how do we restore this stuff? You know, because we didn't have that recipe. And suddenly I'm like, okay, one, two, three, one through 18. But then I did turn that over back over into the business. Um, I think, you know, the CIO is going to, now I, I've got CIO friends who I classify as chief innovation officers, right? They're highly imaginative and they're business oriented, but a lot of them are come up through the nuts and bolts of IT. So in the end, at a fairly complex organization, I think, you know, I'm not here to say that the CISO shouldn't have alignment under or with the CIO, but there has to be a party that has an impartial view. And that can be the CIO and the CISO, um, but I do think that it resides with the business to understand that risk because the business continuity plan is a risk management plan. So I do think there has to be a higher level group to which the CISO and the CIO are part of, and they certainly have a, a core element to drive within it because the CIO has all of those assets. The CIO has, you know, has control and responsibility for all of these assets, but business processes revolve at the business level. So my, my best recipe for this was pulling the business in and creating a committee. I hated the word committee. I like to call them working groups because committees are, tend to be where things go to die. But I think there is a higher level of authority. It depends on the structure of the company. So I, I'm not sure I really answered it. But I, I think the CIO and the CISO, the CISO, in my opinion, because you're here and you're going to get my opinion, has to drive that value question. The CIO might, but the CISO has to because our ability to protect, it, protect in proportion, say that quickly, depends on us understanding that value. And the BCP plan is value in a nutshell. Well, it might not be a nutshell. It could be like this many shells. So, all right. Anybody else? Make something up. Oh, we got one. In, we got another one in the back. Talk about vulnerability here. Like, hey. um, so how do you approach security professionals that are more box checkers, compliance checkers? How do you get past that? How do you actually present the actual risk and, and move forward with that? I'll tell you a strategy that worked that I, I didn't expect, which was, you know, I talked about auditors. And I started, it took me about three and a half years to warm up to internal audit, uh, just honestly. But it's because I'm pig-headed. Um, and I'm like, oh. Let me get the minimum, you know, talk about attack surface management. Um, I was trying to manage. I'm like, present very little. Make yourself thin. And don't let them see. Um, the, developing that relationship, where, where it really took off for me was I held a week-long fair, you know, classroom clinic in the company, and I invited internal audit. Um, and a funny thing happened is we actually kind of, we synthesized, or whatever you want to call it, we started, we, we, we developed, I don't know if it was a camaraderie, but a common view. We said, well, risk matters because it, it's, it, it, it's not just checking the boxes. We, we have those things that are compliance, and yes, we have to check the boxes. You can't have an unencrypted SMB file repository of all the PHI in the company. Nope, can't do that. Ask me how I know. Um, but check the box tends to ref I think as people get more experience they they get past that by and large but yeah um you know I had a team of my own auditors in my in my last role you know and I learned to appreciate the role that IT audit audit had and some there's a there's a place for checking the box like that minimum acceptable level of practice are you doing these things or you're not you have MFA or you don't have MFA it's a yes or no question there's no but actually there can be that's another trick of answering audits but um, I think, so I, I undertook education, and I don't think there's a perfect answer to that. 
uh, external audit may just be looking through their book of um, stuff, you know, and going, well, you don't check these boxes. And, you know, that now we get to the art of pushback, right? It's learning to push back on audit. I'm not recommending it, but sometimes it's that discussion. It's an earnest discussion. It's a relationship with the auditors. Um, check boxes, you know, just, I, this is part of my attempt to get past the check boxes is, you know, like I said, showing a CEO, you know, thousands of vulnerabilities just didn't matter to him. Checking the boxes, people will go through with it. I'm not, you know, statistically, not an official stat, but probably over 60% of the companies in the world really do operate that way today, you know. So this is part of, this is part of my public campaign. So I, again, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily answering the question, but I think education, dialogue, and engagement, and then ask them why. Why do these checkboxes matter? Well, because it's a checkbox. Why? Well, because I have a subscription to Cobit. And I'm like, ah, Cobit. We could have a whole nother lunchtime talk about Cobit. Wouldn't that be fascinating? <laughs> All right. More questions. Anything? Ask. Ask me anything, but it has to be in relevance to the to the talk, hopefully. All right, so I put something up. You can get to this; it's public. You, you're probably get it. You're probably gonna download it and go, "Wait, this is just marketing." Yeah, it's marketing, but there's some useful information in there because it's it's something free you can get to that has a hint of the analytics and things that Marsh is doing because we have a lot of claims data as a broker. Um, I also. I wonder, is there anybody here? I don't, hopefully you, get, I, the, you can get to these slides, but business risk ownership, this was a process for me to move into, you know, when I had a 27,001 certified program and we had thousands of people, how did we do that? Well, we started embedding fractional FTEs within the business departments. So um, I have a whole separate recipe for that and we drove it into our reporting metric and those kinds of things. This was just a slide I wanted to throw in because I thought it was going to be kind of cool to go, this stuff is how you do it, it's not why. And I just like basic uh, monochrome themes. All right, any other questions? All right, with that, like the, they say on the Zoom meetings, I'll give you three minutes back. Thank you very much. <laughs>